uh, rolling. Right. Uh, this is take two. Here's well, I flew down the ranch and Johnson uh, gave me the whole routine. We over went around and saw all of it. But there was that one night where, he, again, one of his uh, treatments, so to speak, was after dinner we went up to uh, see Cousin Oriel. And from the ranch house, uh, his cousin Oriel, I forget her last name, but Oriel lived up in this this one room little house. And Johnson's got his cowboy hat on, these boots, and we we kind of scuff up there. Beautiful night, we stop. And uh, the big full moon coming up over the Perdinalis there, and you can hear the water running. Johnson tells me, oh, Huey says it. The most beautiful sound to a rancher's ear is the sound of running water, the trickle of running water. Listen to that, you know, and tell me about all the wonders. And he's like, I gotta stop and see my cousin here. And so he goes in and hears this wonderfully, wonderfully weather ward old lady, barefooted, uh, in this one room place, the bed's in the middle, the kitchen over here, and, uh, and, uh, their hair pulled back just like you'd expect somebody like that to be. And Johnson, Johnson jumps up on the bed, leans back, puts the hat over his face. Cousin, Cousin Oral, how are you? <laughs> well, little, I think she, the, those people down there all called him Linton. Linton. Well, Linton, I'd be a lot better if you'd help me. You know, oh, Cousin Oral, here we go again, you know. Well, he said, I, she, she said, I got that tractor I'm trying to say. Oh, that old bunch of junk, I'm not going to buy that from They have this conversation about the old tractor and about how he should do more for it. And, uh, and he talks about how, what do you mean you got your house here you're down the road? You know, we see all the time and that sort of thing. And uh, it goes back and forth. That's the Cousin Oriel routine, which became quite famous. And it was, it was fascinating. I, I mean, there's just no question. It's, it's, a, it's a paradox. Here she is living this one room shack. And I think, to be honest with you, she wanted to. I mean, that was just her life, and I, I don't know what else you'd do with it. And he kept her. I'm quite sure they kept her going. And that, but anyway, on the way back, uh, I, I can't remember whether we went out to it or not, but there's the family graveyard. And uh, we stopped and, uh, at the family gra graveyard, and, uh, and Johnson uh, points out the various people, his daddy, his mama, and all of that, and then he, and then he points out uh, where that he, he and Lady Bird are going to be uh, going to be buried there and then uh, we start to walk away and he unzipped and peed <laughs> it was just you know one of those things that just comes out of nowhere <laughs> and you wonder <laughs> I'm kind of half admiring of him because I'm I'm kind of a skeptic about burial routines and that, you know, it's over, it's over, <laughs> get out of there. I must say, though, that when he died, I went down to his, uh, to his funeral. I couldn't get that out, of, that out of my mind as I watched the solemn ceremonies going on at <laughs> Johnson. Now, I, mine wasn't as bad as Carol Kirkpatrick, one of my colleagues, a Washington Post uh, reporter, and, and there, Johnson actually peed on the on the, on the hallowed ground there, where he and Lady Bird were going to be buried. Anyway, it was uh, you know that was just Johnson. I, I, he just kind of took that in in stride, and and we went on then uh, uh, to the convention and all of that. I, uh, Lennon kind of got ticked off at me. They the magazine. Oh, I tell you, there's, a, there's another wonderful story. Uh, Otto Furbringer, who was the managing editor of Time, loved uh, Johnson. He's colorful and he made good copy and all that. So every now and then he'd asked, to, well, now, the first time he asked to see Johnson as majority leader as we were coming up. So, okay, I went in and, and uh, uh, whoever was out there said, go in and ask the leader, he's in there, and I went, I said, Otto Furbring, the managing editor, would like to come around if you got some time from it. Uh, Otto Furbring, oh, Otto, my old friend Otto, I'd love to see him, love to see him, sure, and we set a time, and it was about two weeks ahead when, when he could come, so kind of, it kind of lay fallow there for a while, and forgot about it, and about the, the, uh, the day before he was due, for the appointment, I was walking up by the office there. 
Johnson uh, Johnson comes out of the back door of his Sadie, 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 come here. He said, What the, I got this damn thing on my appointment, Bick. You know, who is this thing banger, foo finger, far finger? Who is this guy? <laughs> I said, Come on, that's your old friend Otto, remember? <laughs> well, he didn't like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, No, he's managing that. All right, all right. But hilarious. Oh, Yes, well, I never told Otto that, you know, thing banger or whatever he had. Which, which tell, which uh, is another story, you know, we'll be here all night because these things came up and I, I, my type of reporting was to report the man. And uh, it, it uh, these little, little things came up and they were rooted in the past. This one spans the difference between, uh, or spans the time he was majority leader and then also when he was in the White House. Uh, he, was, he used to mispronounce the names of people. And, uh, and that was the first example I had, Otto Fingbinger. You no, know, and I, I didn't think anything about it, but we got, then, then he became president. I was in there once and Johnson was denouncing somebody by the name of Shulak. That son of a bitch, Shulak. Where'd he get that stuff? How does he come on? <laughs> this went on about two minutes, and George Reedy was there, and I leaned over. And I said, George, who is Shulak? And he said, that's, that's Tad Schultz of the New York Times. <laughs> and then, then, then he, one time I was in there, and he had a big, a, a big tirade against uh, Weintaub. Weintaub, that guy, you know. Well, it was, it was Teddy Weintaub. He was talking about it. And then he had Sid Davis. I didn't think much about that till I thought back again when he was majority leader. And he was telling me how admiring he was of Huey Long. And Huey Long was senator when Johnson was in Congress. And Johnson told me the story that he knew the doorkeepers over in the Senate. And he told them that any time Huey Long spoke or gave a speech or was in a debate on the Senate floor, he wanted to know about it, and he had privileges on the Senate floor as a congressman. And he could sneak in there and sit in the back. And he said, I tell you, that man was just unbelievable. Nobody could keep up with him in debate. And he said, I remember when there one time when he was with old Joe Robinson, who was, I guess, majority leader at that time. He said, old Huey, just throw those darts at him. He said he didn't have a chance. He said, Hugh, blood was splattered all over the walls of that place before the debate was over. He's the smartest man I ever knew. Well, after that, I was reading the, the book about Huey Long, or Kingfish or whatever it is, the book. Uh, and Huey Long used to do that. I'm convinced that's where he picked that up. It said this was a kind of one of the hallmarks of Huey Long's debating stuff. He'd mispronounce the guy's name, or he'd get some mix-up, and the guy's correct him, he'd, he'd be thrown off his stride by it. And I think this Johnson had, a, had adopted this, and he, had a, and he carried it out clear up till uh, through the presidency. But anyway, the time came around, and uh, Johnson was, they shifted me to Kennedy, so I, I wasn't around, and Johnson uh, called up and, uh, said, I know you're second rate me because you got Sidey off the beat there and, and he complained to me about it too and I said, no, I just, one of those things that I think you gotta take your odds on this. I, uh, I by that time had pretty well decided that Kennedy was gonna get it, that Johnson didn't have the horsepower and uh, didn't have the delegates, the Kennedys had changed changed everything, uh, changed really the power equation in politics. Uh, they'd used the pollsters and they'd used the handlers and they had all the money and that so uh, it, it worked out that way. But then I, I uh, tried to keep track of, uh, of, of Johnson during his vice presidency. It was hard but he'd call up every now and then kind of wistfully and said, come on over you, let's talk. And uh, I remember they sent him over to meet the convoy that went across East Germany into Berlin during that Berlin crisis. I exactly when that would have been, summer of 61, two, something like this. And uh, John Johnson came back, and it was a moving moment. He'd, he'd flown into Berlin, he was with Adenauer, uh, the troops uh, that were in this convoy that had gone across Soviet-occupied part of East Germany into, uh, we, didn't, we didn't know what would happen. And Johnson had gone there. Well, 
it was Johnson's only chance. You know, he'd been in the shadow of of those Kennedy people. I remember I went over there and and I came out of there with about six inscribed pictures. Here I am with Adenauer. Here I am with General. So so here I am with the troop. There you say. There you say. I was burdened out with it. But he was just. He was. I felt kind of sorry he was a lonely man. I mean, here's this man who had been as majority leader. Let me tell you, on uh, many days, more po he was the most powerful political figure in America. So recognized, so honored. I mean, when Ike was off shoot, playing golf up in Gettysburg, Johnson was the man you went to to kind of orchestrate politics and the national agenda. He was a spokesman in that. So, so here's this poor guy relegated to this job of being the vice president. And we go down to Dallas on that day, and I remember I, he was uh, he was uptight about it, no question. I remember standing on the uh, the motorcade. This this was Fort Worth, uh, in front of the hotel where they'd stayed that night. And there was John Connolly, of course, and uh, and Johnson, and it was kind of an uneasy situation. Number one, I think Johnson didn't know what was what was going to happen. I thought he. Th probably thought there'd be some booze or some of those extreme right-wingers that'd be unpleasant. Uh, but, and then he had trouble with Ralph Yarborough. Ralph wanted a little more prominence in the motorcade. And that. Johnson, talk about names again, Johnson. Always called him Raph. <laughs> old, old Raph Yarborough. <laughs> and they got it. They, they had to switch cars and Raph was sore about it, I recall it. Well, we flew over to Dallas then from that. And, and uh, that afternoon, well, I've described that many times, and others have too. But I do, but I did, I, since I knew Johnson so well and had been around him so long, I did, I did have a terrible heartache for him in this situation, and which I knew the Kennedys had, had really treated him badly in many ways. The family, I think Bobby and the others, uh, not John Kennedy, I think John Kennedy went out of his way to, uh, while he was vice president, to make him feel important and in on things. But uh, back in those days, that wasn't much. Uh, Kennedy, and Kennedy kind of had, s uh, not scorn for him, but uh, uh, it, even, even the president kind of looked down at him a little bit, you know, you know, laughed at him a little bit. Uh, and although I, I have to say I've told this many times, and that's the idea of why Lyndon Johnson took the vice presidency, and 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 the part of the story, part of the story was that, uh, you know, that uh, John Kennedy, they were all against it. It was just this accident of history. Well, I flew out to Los Angeles with John Kennedy and Jackie. I went up to uh, Long Island, stayed overnight with him. I saw John Kennedy alone with Jackie up there. We were talking about it. I said, have you chosen your vice president? He said, yes. He said, I'll tell you, but you can't use it. And I said, don't do that, Mr. President. He said, I think I know who it is, but I don't want to be bound by that. It'll probably leak by the time our deadline comes around. And then we got to talking about it. He said, well, if I, I, if I could choose the one I wanted, I would, have, I would choose Lyndon Johnson. He said, without question, he's the most talented. He could help me in Texas. He can help with the legislation. This man is, is amazing as a legislator and that. And he said, I, I'd take him, but he said he won't take it. Well, one of the reasons he'd asked to see me uh, was he knew I'd spent two or three hours with Johnson just a couple of days ago before that. And that's, of course, Johnson spent to all, all that time telling me how, why he wouldn't be vice president. And I was convinced that he wouldn't take it. And, uh, and Kennedy was too. So I said, well, I think you're right. That's what essentially he's told me, and I think that's probably correct. Uh, it, but uh, uh, in any event, what, out of that story came, and that's always been in my mind, that Kennedy said no. I'll take him if I could. And then Kennedy went on when we were talking to say, I, I, he said, I'll have to offer it to him. He said, that's, that's polite and that, and I'll offer him to him, but he'll turn it down and then I'll take my choice. Well, basically he had great admiration for Johnson, as I did in, in, his, in his own way. Anyway, came that day at Dallas and I was, I was just appalled. I, you know, who, I can't get my mind around that yet. I mean, a friend was killed. Uh, 
president was murdered, that the new frontier was over. I, I knew enough about the presidency by that time to know that you'd bring in new people and all, and, and despite your best intentions, it wouldn't be the same. It would be quite different. And particularly with Lyndon Johnson, a strong leader, as it should be. It should be a takeover. And uh, I, the motorcade went on, and I didn't, they were in uh, Parkland Hospital. I ultimately ended up there and uh, was roaming around. The first time I saw Johnson, I was standing at the, uh, at, the, at the back of Parkland Hospital, a loading ramp there. And, uh, and he came out to go to the, go to, to the airport. And I often wonder, because there was a report that he'd had a heart attack, and I remember he came out and he was holding his arm. I don't know why. Just a Johnson habit, I think. I don't know what it was. But I noticed as he went to the car, and he kind of orchestrated who was going to go. I wasn't on the pool, so I didn't go out to the, uh, out to the uh, airport uh, with them, but, uh, but he drove away. And even in that time, I mean, he'd just been in the hospital. The, this was a man, this was a leader. This is the guy who knew how to take hold. You know, nobody had ever been in this situation, at least in our generation. Nobody really in the history of the country had been in a situation like this. Your, your president shot right in front of your eyes. Uh, uh, you're the president, uh, but you're with the family. What do you do? You have to fly back. The, the whole kind of uh, equation of trying to solve that. Well, he j he was just magnificent, and I and I again thought to myself, well, I knew that I knew that because I knew him. I knew how he knew government, how he knew cabinet officers, how he knew where people were and what they were apt to do and what they were apt to say and how they would do it. And and the, and the record shows that uh, how he talked to. Uh, Earl Warren into, on the commission. But he knew, he had in his mind, I think, every step of the way. First off, comfort Jackie. Second off, you've got to be president. That goes on. You talk to Bobby, you talk to Rose. Uh, you stay out of sight. You, you, you back up. There was some criticism of him. It was just absolutely invalid. He was restrained. He understood. He stayed behind. But a president of the United States can't. He can't just fade away. And he didn't. He was there. And there was great strength. And then he called, he called the leaders. He called the cabinet. He had everything going. He alerted people uh, about the possibility of other uh, such attacks, perhaps globally. Uh, and, the, and then he moved in, and he wouldn't move into the White House till after Jackie was gone. I think those 48 hours are one of the remarkable events of that half century uh, done by Johnson. Just his sensitivity, his understanding, how he rallied the people, brought the leaders together, got the commission started to examine that, assured people the country would go on. And I, I just, as I watched Johnson go to his car with his hand on there, I, I just had that sense, this guy, thank goodness he's there. Thank goodness this is the man for this moment at this time. And then, of course, I saw him I, uh, around the White House, but we were so preoccupied with the ceremonies, the burial of, of, of Kennedy and Johnson stayed kind of to the side and that, but, but, uh, but Instantly, when that was all done and he moved into the White House, why then he began to assert his leadership and uh, in his own way. And he'd asked, the, as we all know, he'd asked the Kennedy people to stay on. He'd done it in Johnson's way, saying, I need you, I need you, and that. But uh, we knew that it would change, and it did. As time went on, it, it did change. And, uh, well, he was just, uh, he was every bit as as colorful in the White House as he was, as he was uh, outside it. And at first, at least, we, we used to, uh, uh, you know, we, we would write about it. As things got tougher, Vietnam and all that sort of thing, why it changed, he withdrew. Every president has. The, the critics grow louder and louder, and he withdrew. But it, in those early years, this was kind of the raw Lyndon Johnson in the Oval Office, you know, he, again, the gadget man was there. He, he, uh, 
he just loved those helicopters and uh, I remember when they and when they came out with the felt tip pen when he festooned his body with those he just loved to write little notes we were walking around the back that was another thing he did he'd grab the reporters we'd walk an hour or more around the back and jo it was a hot day and Johnson took his coat off and a red one the cap had come off and I think the Secret Service nearly died they thought he'd been shot you know a big splot of red red and he got the, one of the early alarm wristwatches and Stuart Udall told me it kept going off in the cabinet meetings <laughs> Johnson hadn't said it right and he'd claw his wrist to shut it off and, and Udall told me furthermore he went in there one day and and there were three buttons in front of the president's chair he hadn't seen before red green and blue he said oh my he joked at one of the cabinet oh my goodness things are bad in Vietnam it's the button it's the button he went over and he leaned down and read fresca root beer and coffee <laughs> they were hooked up to the galley Dad Johnson, uh, Johnson the, the shower is a famous story I, re I remember I found out about that from a doctor friend of mine who was his eye doctor and uh, Johnson, had, he'd been summoned one morning at 5 o'clock, the phone rang, and they said, get down there, Johnson's got an eye problem. The president, he said, the Secret Service car is already almost there, pick you up. And he said, oh, God, yes. And the car screeched up, we were out in Potomac, Maryland, screeched up in front of the house, and, and the, uh, and the uh, car raced through the deserted streets of Washington. And there was old Dr. Berkeley who was on the North Portico welcoming this uh, uh, Dr. Jack McTide. And, and he said, come on, come on, come on. He said he went up there and Johnson was splayed out over in his, in his private bedroom or someplace up there, splayed out over, and he went. <laughs> and he said, I went over there and I looked. He said, I took out my handkerchief like a Boy Scout, rolled it up and flicked out a piece of dust. <laughs> and that was all. And Johnson said, thank you, doctor. And then he got up, and he and Jack McTie was a funny man, and he said, "I'd never seen anything like this." He said, "Johnson had been in his bathroom, but it was time for the shower," and he said, "He he said he held out his hands like that, and he said his valet or whatever it was stripped his 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 bathrobe off, and he held out a foot, and he took his slipper off." <laughs> <laughs> he said, here is this dude Preston, this great huge man and he said, I don't know whether to look or not look. And they said he went into the shower and there's this terrible rumbling and thumping of uh, Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the, the doctor then said that Johnson went into the shower and this, there was this awful rumbling and thumping <laughs> so he, he asked Dr. Berkeley he said what's that he said Dr. Berkeley said well Johnson t t takes a nap every afternoon and he likes to take a cold shower and he said there wasn't enough water pressure he wasn't satisfied with the water pressure so we had the plumber come in here and rig this shower that sh shot its stream from the sides and the top and uh, and uh, at 80 pounds per square inch of uh, pressure and it kind of pummels him back to consciousness <laughs> and he said but when he turns it on it it strains the plumbing system in the White House well that's a famous story but uh, Admiral uh, or old Jack McTide said man he said you know he's some kind of character but this was him he, he loved to try all these all these things that uh, that he had and I've, I've told the story so many times about those busts of himself that he had made up in three sizes, small, medium, and large. And they were up, they were nice busts, to be honest with you. They were, uh, but it was a plastic that almost resembled metal, but they were plastic, basically plastic busts, but they were good. But when we'd travel abroad, he'd carry them with him. And he'd give you, depending on his affection or his respect for whomever, he'd give him a bust, a small one. <laughs> and uh, the first time, we saw it was up in Korea on the DMZ. I think that was '66. He gave the that he gave the boys a large size plastic bust of himself, and he put it on the podium there on the table. Kind of patted himself on the head as he was talking to the troops, 
And I guess was so swept away in that company. That's where he, he told the world that uh, his great-grandfather had died at the Alamo. That was pure fiction, of course. And I, I mentioned in a couple of columns, and of course, Johnson was sore about that. And, I, and finally, I think it was Moyers, it finally told Moyers, after, after it settled down, he got over being mad about what I'd written. He told Moyers or somebody that he said, well, he said, had Sidey been there, seen those wonderful men, why? He'd have, he'd have done. He'd have said his ancestor was George Washington. <laughs> so, so that was. But when we went around the world, there was all of that. And I, and and, uh, and then there was a place where he, he hit an Air Force base, some remote outpost over there, where they had no Dr. Pepper. He loved uh, loved Dr. Pepper, so he made the order went out that all Air Force bases where he was going to had to stock Dr. Pepper. And then I, it was 67, where Johnson had this idea that he would go to Harold Holt's funeral. Poor old Harold Holt had been drowned in the surf or eaten by a shark. Nobody knew exactly what, what happened to him. And Johnson said, he, and Harold Holt had been a supporter of his in Vietnam, and Australians had sent up troops and that. And Johnson said, you know, where I come from, you go, your friends, you go to the funerals, weddings. So off we went, just before Christmas of 1967. And, uh, and we, we stopped in Canberra, Australia. And Johnson had a secret plan, hadn't told anybody about it. And he wanted to, f and did, fly on around the world. Uh, and didn't tell anybody where he was going, you know. But essentially, we all knew it leaked out that he was headed for Rome. Uh, but as, as, uh, ostensibly, the President of the United States disappeared in the skies of Asia. And we landed in, uh, there were sightings, of course, all the way through. We landed in the Karat, Thailand, where he watched the planes come in. And then we were in Karachi, Pakistan, and then lo and behold, on Christmas Eve, six or seven American helicopters that they've sent up from Naples uh, picked Johnson up, and, and then they they materialize out of the mists over St. Peter's Square. You know, there are 20,000 people down there for the Pope's blessing. They terrorized those people. You know, all this flotilla of American airplanes. And it, and it turns out somebody hadn't calculated the weight of all of these people landing in the Vatican Gardens. Uh, because they're catacombed, the Vatican was catacombed in the mountains, and they they'd fueled all these helicopters clear up to the brim. So they had to circle for 45 minutes to burn the fuel off before they could land. And we and we landed in the Vatican Garden. I can still see old Merriman Smith and some of the other reporters leaping out in these priceless box bushes. You know, they were there. And Johnson went up into the Pope's library and gave him a plastic bust of himself. It was one of the great, great moments of our time. I, there were only a few of us left standing because we'd only been on the, only one night on the ground in a bed, four and a half days around the world. We were all paralyzed. We were just beyond, you know, and I remember Frank, the late Frank Reynolds was there with myself. Frank couldn't handle it. He was lying on the ground laughing so hard about this whole crazy spectacle that had taken place and, uh, and I remember I, it, it, was just, it was just before Christmas, Christmas Eve. We got back in America on Christmas Eve. We followed the sun uh, over. And, uh, and uh, uh, all of it, so nothing much was written about it. It kind of just, the whole kind of crazy idea kind of disappeared into the mist because everybody was preoccupied with Christmas and that. But I wrote a piece in, in life and I still love to think about the, uh, the headline on it. It was, Around the World with Lyndon B. Magellan. <laughs> and, I, and I am told that Johnson just went ballistic when he saw that was one more mark against me. I, I thought the whole thing was crazy. Actually, I've gone back and read the piece. It wasn't that bad. And he did talk with the Pope, and that was a tense time in Vietnam, and so it wasn't, it wasn't all negative. But that, the, the Johnson, the gadget man, he had all these things that he had, had going and, and doing. Uh, so many sessions. Johnson used to see us, not only on our walks around. He'd take us around the, uh, the grounds, but uh, uh, wherever in those early years. I remember, uh, 
and he, wa he again he wanted to talk with with you I it was totally impractical and it wasn't going to work and it didn't finally work there are people that told the stories and everybody snickered about them that you know again the character the times he had interviewed people while he was on the toilet and that sort of thing kept coming out and then uh, I forget what this what the story was with Charlie Moore the New York Times and uh, there was some little conflict of interest and Johnson swept up a bunch of people and took them in after an event and talked to them and then said any questions and Charlie <laughs> brought up this this small question and that that's when the famous rejoinder came of, J of Johnson and uh, which he said and here you are with the leader of the free world and you ask a chicken shit question like that <laughs> that of course ricocheted through the whole press corps <laughs> and I must say I, I was kind of I kind of loved it because it, it's kind of described the situation <laughs> as you know and uh, I, you know, you'll have to forgive the naughty words, but uh, they just, they came out. And I have to say this, though. Uh, when, when the Nixon tapes came out, uh, Nixon was far more foul-mouthed than Johnson. I never heard that sort of swearing when Nixon was in public. Johnson swore, there isn't any question about it, but not that, like that. And his, his words were chosen so that you almost never forgot them but I, I, I do remember <laughs> again it was one of those nights everything had gone wrong and that and he had a little bunch of us in the, uh, the little study or in the Oval Office and uh, I think it was Jack Sutherland the US News one of those stupid questions that sometimes isn't so stupid said well what's it like being mr. president or being president now it was shortly after he took over and he said, well, I'll tell you, boys, it's just like being a dog in the country down in Texas. He said, if you run, they're always snapping at your ass, and if you stop, they fuck you to death. And, and like, like all of Johnson's stories, I had to, when I went out, I had to clean it up when I told it, but I, but I, I said, well, you know, there's certain truth to that. Now that I, I think about it, they, they, it makes a point. Uh, Anyway, Johnson, Johnson in the Oval Office, it was an uncomfortable fit, right at first, the personal Johnson, because these stories began to come out, and, uh, and then, of course, he was hit with Vietnam. I'm not sure anybody would have known what to do with that, and he was, he was overwhelmed with that, as we all were at that time. Uh, and we, and we just, we watched, we watched the, the man himself as, as as closely as, as we could there were there were little episodes that again reflected badly I uh, Churchill died Winston Churchill Johnson didn't want to go to the funeral I don't know why he, had, he was out in the naval hospital but we all always thought that was phony he went out there for a cold or something and in the course of that stay why well, he talked about well I'm he said well he referred to it as that funeral I don't understand why people want me to go to that funeral as if it was just another funeral. Hubert Humphrey went. Uh, not, a, not a good thing to say, not a, perhaps an understanding of uh, Churchill's role in the world. Uh, a lot of little things like that happened along the way. Johnson was not comfortable with television. Uh, he tried to make up for it with these intimate moments. And there were some wonderful ones when bills were passed, I'd go in and he'd take you down that little little office and explain what he did. Uh, we had the Glassboro Summit meeting. And I can recall when we flew on Air Force One back to, uh, back to uh, the ranch that night from Glassboro, New Jersey. He was talking about, uh, about uh, with Kasegan, I think it was, were there two of them, Kasegan, and the, I think there was another one, but Kasegan was kind of the principal Soviet representative uh, in that summit meeting. And uh, Johnson, uh, talking about meeting these people, saying, you know, here I was representing a free democratic society, and he could say, said, I could make almost any decision I wanted. He said, here are these, 
these people represented a dictatorship. And he said they had to call Moscow every time they wanted to go to the men's room. They didn't have any power. They had to check back with their people in the Politburo. And then he told stories about, he, he always sized up these people. And he, he said, you know, I, we were, he, my, he said, my daddy always told me, if you're in an argument with somebody, keep your eyes fixed on his eyes. Don't, don't look away. So he said we got into this talk, I don't know what it was about Vietnam or something, and he said I had his eyes fixed on, I, had, I, I was focused on his eyes, because and I think this was, and he said uh, I was suddenly got thirsty. And he said I, I, there was a cup of coffee on the co coffee table, I didn't dare look away. He said I kept it, I, kept, I felt my way on the coffee table. He said, I took a sip of coffee, and then he looked away. <laughs> now, people will probably laugh about that, but there's a little truth to that. little truth to that. Just the, the, the dominant figure in these, in these strange little ways like that. He talked about, he talked to the, them about chopping wood, how many, how many cords Johnson could chop, and, and uh, what he called chopping cotton. He uh, talked about that, how he did now, and then he'd pick and cotton, he'd bloody his fingers and that sort of thing. These guys, I've decided these leaders, uh, or, or that group of leaders around the world, all swapped these tall tales about how tough they did. <laughs> and Johnson was right in there. Uh, he, loved, he loved flying. I think he liked the motion. He was a telephone freak. I'd never seen so many telephones in my life. You know, they were always ringing. They never were prepared. I, I, Henry Luce, one night, we went up to dinner. And again, the gadget the gadget guy. And there's bi this big, tall pepper mill standing there. You know, automated pepper mill, big thing. <laughs> and so we sit down to dinner, and it's Luce and myself and Johnson, and I think maybe Harry McPherson or somebody, a small little dinner up there. And I, Luce kept looking at that pepper mill. He'd never seen one before. I can't imagine it, but apparently not. And uh, he asked, he said, what's that? He said, pepper mill. Didn't say anything more. Luce kind of forgot. And then they served the steaks, and Johnson picked that thing up. <laughs> and pepper flew all over every blur. Put it back down. I could see Luce over there. Luce reached out and took it. He gave it a couple of shots. And then, and then Johnson took it away from Luce. <laughs> he reached out and took it away, put it way away from me. Uh, uh, and then, in the course of that, the course of that evening, we were eating. Phone rang. I didn't. There wasn't a phone around that I could see. Well, it turned out it was strapped to the leg of that Heppel White furniture that he reached underneath, pulled the phone out. I went to see him in his little study once down from the Oval Office, and we were sitting there around a the little coffee table. Phone rang. He had a little secret drawer in there where he pulled the phone out. I was walking over in the East Room one time, uh, uh, and he was telling me about his admiration for Franklin Roosevelt was just undimmed at any time. And they had a bust of Roosevelt over there in that corridor along the, uh, as you go to the East Wing. And he stopped at the Roosevelt bust, and he took it. It was almost sensual. He, he took the chin, he said, this is the greatest man that ever lived, look at the strength of this face. He kind of caressed it there. And as we moved off, a phone rang. Well, we're walking, at, you, know, and I, you know, that was before the time of cell phones. Johnson went over, and there, and there was a pillar with a drape around it, and he reached around <laughs> there. They'd put, the, put a phone in, they knew his habits. And then I, and then my, uh, my uh, neighbor was then the head of, uh, well, what would it have been? It was the original phone company, but he was in Washington. And uh, he was in charge of the White House detail, and that was a huge, huge business. All the, all the phones for the White House and that. And Johnson, you know, was just nuts about phones. It looked, his phone bank, I think, had 32 buttons or something. The, the, you know, the other presidents had a half a dozen, but Johnson was like a B-52 cockpit, you know, with all this stuff. And my, uh, and my, uh, Bill Lindholm was his name, good Texan, from Austin, I believe. And, but he did all that stuff. One night he said, oh, he said, you can't imagine, you the problems. Number one, they had to rig up a phone 
that floated on a raft for the swimming pool <laughs> down at the ranch. And they'd plug that in and float it out to Johnson. Then he said, but that wasn't the biggest problem. He said one night, he was down walking near the Pertinalis, which is probably about 50, 60 yards or something like 100 yards maybe from the house. And, and apparently it happened all the time. They'd get a call up there and the Secret Service would run down and say, Mr. President, you're wanted back on the phone. There wasn't a phone down there. And again, they didn't have the mobile phones at that time. So Johnson said, I want, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. Now, you, you, you work it out. So Lindholm said they, they, de they devised this telephone that they put on a 100-yard cord or whatever it was that reeled up like a garden hose. <laughs> He said so when the phone would run, these guys would run out and unreal his phone so that he could stand there and talk by the by the Pertinellis River. Oh, may I could just. Uh, oh.